Welcome to another talk on Seminole War history. Now, hopefully I can do this without the washing machine next door or the leaf blower out in the street. So try, hopefully no disruptions here. Um, I want to talk about the 1820s in Seminole War history uh, between the first and second Seminole War. And I'll have to do this over several different programs. So, you know, I try to keep it down less than 30 minutes. Um, but a lot happened in those 15 years. Uh, last time I talked about Andrew Jackson as the first territorial governor and the effect on the Seminoles and Miccosukee people in Florida. 1820s is a very complicated period of history. And so I won't be doing a linear progression like I did in the other videos. It's easier to talk about trends and things that are going on. And most of the information I get from the, you have the Indian Affairs papers from the National Archives, that's on microfilm. In fact, I, I view it at the State Library of Florida. And my friend Joe Kadish actually has copies of the pages. And some of that is reprinted in the territorial papers. This is the Florida territorial papers. Territorial Papers of the United States by Carter, Volume 22, Florida Territory, 1821 to 1824. It doesn't reproduce all the letters from Indian Affairs. So you're getting a biased view. Uh, for example, there's a negotiation between Governor Duval and uh, John Hicks, and they published the Duval's letters but in the territorial papers, they don't publish John Hicks' response. And I found that in the Indian Affairs letters, but I'll talk about that another time because that's a couple years down the road from what I want to talk about today. Andrew Jackson's first term as governor ended on December 1st, 1821. Oops, get my share here. And there were two interim governors uh, in Florida at the time. Oh, it's not getting my share, sorry. Uh, there are two interim governors after Jackson left on December 31st, 1821. Actually, he left a couple months earlier, but his term officially ended on December 31st. There was uh, George Walton and uh, William Worthington. One was East and one was West Florida. Walton was West Florida. Worthington was East Florida. Anyway, that doesn't matter because in 1822, it was decided to merge East and West Florida into one territory. And William Pope Duval, who was a judge in St. Augustine, he was uh, originally from Kentucky, another Jackson person. And he became Florida governor in eight, April 1822. That's a picture of him. He has family all over the place. Uh, a lot of them in Texas, famous at the same time. Interesting history They Actually had yeah, Duval family reunion here in Tallahassee a couple years ago. So uh, Florida governor, the territorial governor still has responsibilities as Indian agents and much of Governor Duvall's administration is spent functioning as the Indian agent uh, due to uh, vacancy or, or absence of the Indian agent at the time. He was the longest serving governor in the history of Florida from the US history for 12 years from 1822 to 1834. The Indian agent that had been picked during Jackson's administration, Mr. Jean Paniers, he died of yellow fever after two months in his post. Uh, and his replacement, Peter Pelham, never showed up for the job. So now the function of Indian agent falls to Captain John Bell in St. Augustine. He's temporarily fulfilling the position. Captain Bell is not the same 
John Bell, who later became Secretary of State. I had to uh, check on that you know, first, I thought it was. Um, Captain Bell uh, later was involved in uh, some, uh, I guess, some problems in the Army. He was court martialed. He kicked the uh, he kicked the charge, and but he died in 1825. So that's why we don't know much about it there. Had a short career. Uh, after Governor Duvall, next we have Gad Humphreys. I don't have, really have a good picture of him. This is grave in the Huguenot Cemetery in St. Augustine. You know, I don't have a portrait of him. He was appointed the Indian agent under Duvall to take up some of the Indian agent responsibilities. An excuse why he was appointed agent uh, was that his position in the army, the army was downsized and he was one of the officers that was eliminated. So he needed a job. It seems like all these people that they're appointing the Indian agent uh, are appointed because they need a job, real bad patronage going on there. Uh, Gad Humphreys is act actually turns out to be a good Indian agent and someone who is dedicated to the job. He's eventually replaced several years later because he's not removing the Indians fast enough from the territory and not returning enough of the escaped slaves. So, uh, so you know, but more on him later. There's a lot of letters, Duval and Humphreys in the Indian Affairs letters. The government Still didn't know much of anything about the Indians. Captain Bell estimated the population was at 5,000. As far as we know, uh, that's a pretty good number. Uh, we don't know how he came up with that number. Uh, the government hires uh, Jebediah Morse to conduct the survey and count the Florida Indian population. Governor Morse also came up with an estimated 5,000 in Florida. This number is fought with problems, but without a better number, that's what's been said for this time of history in the past 200 years. We have several people at this time who agree with that number. John T. Sprague estimated the Florida Indian population just so short of 4,000 Indians and 800 blacks, uh, black Seminoles. And that's probably pretty realistic. That's almost 5,000 right there. But the government doesn't agree, and then it says that the Florida Indian population is only 1,800. And this is unfortunately turns into a problem because 1,800 as a number is disastrous because the treaty has the government has to provide food or rations to the Indians, and they totally fail on this, but more about that later. After reducing the army twice after the War of 1812, the trend was smaller government is better. In reality, that's disastrous because what resulted was really no government at all. <laughs> Answers from Washington were slow. The new territory ended up with no clear policy or agreements with the native people who were already there living on land that the United States claimed for itself. Since at this point, nobody was there to act as agent or to negotiate with Indians for several months up to a year. There was no policy or direction from the state or the federal government. As mentioned as in the previous video, the Americans wanted to remove the Indians from Florida territory. Jackson didn't think they had any title or claim to land. It should be removed. He also believed that treaties were useless because he believed they had no claim. He looked upon them no more as uh, homeless squatters. Notice that here the United States made a treaty with the Florida Indians in 1823. This is a map four years later in 1827. It does not have the reservation on outlined by the treaty. So the government had no intention to move the Indians at all. The United States wanted to move in Florida and conduct land sales, but you can't do that with the Indians living on the land that you want to sell. So the Americans wanted to figure out a way to 
do away with Indians. Governor Duvall decided to put them on land away from the coast as far enough south as and far enough away from settlement in areas that nobody else wanted at the time. Governor Duvall said, you know, we have several of the Indians living along the Suwannee River, but they can't live there because that's good growing land. You know, we can't have the Indians living on there. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, well, but things were moving very slow. Another yellow fever epidemic in 1822 made everyone evacuate the cities, Pensacola and St. Augustine. Governor Duvall, he left for Kentucky and left no instructions to the acting governor, Walton, in Pensacola. And no word on what to say with the Indians and no word from Washington. So, you know, everything's just stalled out. The Indians were very patiently waiting with nothing happening them, they received no answer. Um, there was a very bad drought at this time, a bad year of crops, and everybody was starving. Governor Duvall agreed to meet with the chiefs and then missed his own meeting. And Neamathala and the Seminoles uh, came and were the only ones in attendance. And they waited a while, and after a few days, they left. Worse yet, this was the second meeting Duval had arranged and failed to show up. And that was supposed to be at St. Mark's. The uh, Neamathala and the rest of the Indians uh, expressed remarkable patience uh, to keep the peace. And uh, Neamathala was picked by the chiefs to be their main representatives. The Seminoles were very smart on how they were go and negotiate with the United States. It didn't help that the size of Florida territory hindered all indication. For that reason, ter uh, Tallahassee was established as the territorial capital in 1824. It was uh, about 400 miles, 430 miles between Pensacola and St. Augustine. And if you go from Pensacola to Key West, it's something like 428 miles or, or something like that. Um, just a extremely long distance. And the only settlement in between was the Spanish fortification of St. Mark's. Originally, there's Spanish Mission San Luis, which is where Tallahassee is now. In fact, the recreated mission, you can come view it. Anyway, I'm getting off subject. Finally, after two years of lack of communications, the Indians of Florida wondering where their place would be. And the United States set a place in time to hold treaty talks at Moultrie Creek near St. Augustine in September 1823. The reason why this was picked, it was easy for transportation and to bring in food to feed everyone if you expect several hundred people coming to the treaty talks. Commissioner's meeting with the Indians would include Governor Duval, James Gadsden, uh, who had uh, resigned, James Gadsden had resigned from the army and trying his hand plantation owning in Florida. And like so many Jackson men, he was appointed commissioner to conduct the negotiation with the treaty. Also the American representative was a mayor from St. Augustine, Bernardo Segu. We don't know much about him. He's a Menorcan plantation owner. Notice that Duval, Gadsden, and Bernardo Segu were all plantation owners who owned slaves. But the Indians were not unprepared either because Neamathala was picked as head chief. And it was uh, eventually from the treaty talks he was given reservation land along the Chattahoochee River, which ended up to be the same thing that Governor Jackson had promised him the year before or two years before. So September 1823 at Moultrie Creek, uh, 425 headmen were present. Those who signed the treaty were Duval, Gadsden, Segu, for the Americans, 32 Seminole chiefs, led by Neamathala 
additional signatures of American witnesses were Gad Humphreys, interpreter Stephen Richards uh, from what's today's Calhoun County. Stephen Richards was eventually uh, um, fired from the job as interpreter with the Indian agent. And you also had an army officer, Lieutenant Harvey Brown. He eventually would have a very interesting Indian uh, uh, army career. He would be an officer in charge of the Creek Regiment in the Second Seminole War. He would also be in charge of guarding the Seminole prisoners at Fort Marion. Uh, when the big escape happened and Osceola was there. And also witnessing the treaty was Horatio Dexter, who held the talk, unauthorized talk with Indians that Jackson wanted to kick Horatio Dexter out of the territory. But actually, he becomes a negotiator on the side of the Americans. Since the talks at Moultrie Creek were only five miles from St. Augustine, you had a lot of people from the city coming in and witnessing the talks, the spec spectacle of the colorful encampment. Uh, the treaty went on for about 10 days. Uh, there's no minutes. We don't know how they came to some of these agreements. It's uh, reprinted. You, you can actually look at the Indian treaties online and look at the actual treaty itself. It's also in John T. Sprague's book. Uh, I won't read the whole thing here because you can look it up yourself. But I have some observations to make. As part of the treaty, and here's 1831 map of Florida, the Seminoles are given a reservation 40 miles south of what is today Ocala, 15 miles from the Gulf Coast, and 20 miles from the Atlantic Coast, all the way down from Charlotte Harbor. I've seen it on several different maps. Nobody seems to have the shape of the reservation the same thing. It's unmarked and vague description. The southern part was definitely not surveyed. There's no way anyone can tell where the wine was. You see uh, the blue is the reservation area. The pink on the left of that is Alatra County. The blue to the south is Monroe County, eventually became Monroe and Dade County. And the yellow is my favorite Mosquito County there. <laughs> Mosquito County eventually became Orange Brevard and Volusia, the East Coast counties. Uh, Mosquito County was dissolved in 1845 because it's bad press if you advertise on the mosquitoes. But there is no way anyone could tell where the race reservation was. Uh, parts were surveyed two years later, but was very incomplete. The boundaries had to be adjusted, and an expedition by Gad Humphreys went to examine the reservation and it found it wholly inadequate and not enough arable land for cultivation. Chaka Chatty was said to be so poor soil that nothing could be grown. Kind of interesting observation because in 1842, when the settlers moved in, the Seminoles had been driven out. They said it was the richest and productive growing area in Florida. So somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Uh, why the difference, you know? <laughs> why did, uh, Gad Humphrey say it was bad for growing. Maybe he wanted in on buying the land, but the boundary was extended. And here's from the territorial papers uh, showing the northern boundary was extended. Also, there's two swampy areas kind of on the uh, left hand, uh, upper left hand side. There's long swamp and big swamp. And everybody kept confusing those because they're similar names, even in the Muscogee language, uh, they're very similar names. Uh, Long Swamp Swamp was inside the reservation, but Big Swamp was not. But the Seminoles li lived in both those areas and refused to leave. So they wanted to add the Big Swamp area, said this should be more good land for cultivation. Uh, but there's problems when they extended the northern boundary uh, 20 miles up to about where Micanopy was, it brought it in conflict with the settlers who'd already started moving there in great numbers. 
there around Micanopy. There's also the Arundondo land grant, Haynes Prairie area. That was Moses Levy's, Levy's plantation. And so he was in court for years and litigation and decades later over where the Arundondo grant was and the boundary of the grant. Oh, by the way, this is the actual document of the Arundondo grant in the uh, law library of the Florida Supreme Court. So that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, so the government put itself in conflict with what the reservation was and the settlers who are already moving in, claiming the land. And no wonder Alachua County, Haynes Prairie, Micanopy would be, be the most volatile during the Seminole War. The government forgot, uh, uh, promised to guard the Indians against predatory whites, slave hunter, cattle rustlers, but this turned out to be not be so. There was complaints of attacks by these predators that were not heeded. The whites always went free. The Indians would retaliate. The whites were not allowed to enter Indian land, but there's no way to enforce this. They'd go in there anyway. Uh, if the whites were caught doing this, they could not be held or put trial for trespassing uh, because there is no sheriff or court for doing this. And they were seeking runaway slaves or they were stealing crops and Seminoles or stop stealing crops and cattle from the Seminoles. The Seminoles would retaliate and steal the crops and livestock from the settlers. There was a tremendous drought and everybody was suffering at this time. The government promised to provide beef, cattle, and corn, but they didn't provide enough. A school was supposed to be started by the treaty, but never was. A blacksmith was supposed to be hired. Uh, they couldn't find one, so they uh, contracted a slave owner from the plantation to hire a slave for it, and they would pay the plantation owner. This actually worked out very well for the Seminoles because they're more willing to do, deal with the, the black guy than with the white guy. And archeological work at Chattie found blacksmith work that was probably run by the Indians and the Seminoles. So this was a trade that would be uh, passed on and learned among the Seminoles and the black Seminoles very valuable skill. Also, as part of a treaty, the government would build a road so the whites could travel peacefully. This really didn't become an issue like it did for the Creeks in Alabama and or the Choctaw in Mississippi. The Chickasaw developed quite an interest, industry developing taverns and ferry crossings along the road. Uh, but the Florida Peninsula was so isolated, there really wasn't much reason for a road. You have the Bellamy Road that was north of the Seminole Reservation. Indians moved on to the reservation, would be provided food because of the agricultural improvements they gave up, but the government very badly underestimated the number of rations it would need. The cost of rations increased, the cost of, cost of grain, cattle, and livestock presented a problem, and the governor didn't budget enough money and to increase the money it needed then they would have to change the federal budget in Congress. And that might take two years because sometimes Congress, I don't know if it met every year or every two years at this time, the Florida legislature only met every two years. So you had actually needed an act of Congress to increase the money for the food. Settlers lost their crops and livestock, and the Indians lost their crops and livestock, everything to the devastating drought. And as a result, they raided each other. As part of the treaty, the Indians promised to return fugitive slaves from justice. Here's a newspaper ad of fugitive slaves. You can look at newspaper.com and see many of the ones from that time. For example, Indians re actually did return some fugitive slaves at the beginning, but the plantation owners raided the Seminoles and took some of the black Seminoles. They're said to be non-slaves. 
black Seminoles who were born free in the uh, villages in Florida of uh, could be under the fugitive slave laws. If you're a child of a runaway slave, you would also be property of the slave owner that your parents escaped from. And so that's the problem. You would, if you had never been a slave, a survey was conducted to mark the reservation boundary and to mark trees. And this was only done partially. And as a amendment to the treaty about a week later, they added on to the treaty six of the chiefs who refused to move from their land along the Chattahoochee River in North Florida. They are given uh, like so small sections of land along the Apalachicola River. This included Neamathala, John Blount, Tuskehajo, Mulatto King, Emeth Lochi, Ikanachati Miko. And so the treaty was signed. Here's the last page of it. And it was ratified by the Senate three months later. James T. Sprague said that their Indians were now thrown in a net which there was no escape. Their destiny, happiness, prosperity were now in the hands of the white. At this point, the United States held all the cards. The Seminoles were peaceful, but the US gave them no option. Uh, James Gadsden said that the Indians, to the Indians that the hatchet was buried and the muskets were stacked, but we could change that if we need it to. Uh, he said, don't let General Jackson come down here. Uh, so this, uh, you know, not a veiled threat at all. This is a threat he made to them during the treaty talks. In reality, this was the same way that Andrew Jackson negotiated with the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Cherokees, and the Chick Chickasaws. The treaty was opposed to them, whether they agreed or not. Uh, the only choice they had was to take it or leave it. Now, the treaty park uh, near St. Augustine, we, we don't know where exactly was held, but this in the area, this is uh, a historical marker from that. Uh, and this is the park, unfortunately, you see in the photo on the left, the historical markers there and the monument uh, from about 100 years ago. But unfortunately, in the right photo, you see the historical markers gone, broken off. You know, I think that dated from uh, about a year ago in 2020. And I'm going to see if that's still missing or not. I'm going to contact the folks in Tallahassee who work with the historical markers have them check out on that. But that's uh, Treaty Park, south of St. Augustine. Uh, check it out if you are able to. So that's my talk on the Treaty of Moultrie Creek. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.